All right. So, hi, my name is Amy Castine, and I'm here at Artistic Artifacts today talking to you about beading on fabric. I have an array of things around me, but to begin with, I'd just like to talk a little bit about my process and what I do. Um, when I first start a project like this, um, I just started beading on this today. I have this one little row and I've had this fabric. It's a batik panel and I've had it for some time. So I took it and used some fusing material to attach it to a piece of batting so that I have some substance to it, something to support the fabric. And then I'll just sit with it for a bit. One of the most important things for me is to let the materials sort of speak for themselves. I know it sounds a little hokey and a little bit of, it's silly, but they do, they tell us what they wanna be. I had this piece for about two years before it told me what it wanted to hang out with. <laughs> um, it is a stone that I bought on a trip to New Zealand and I happened to find these larger green beads that are an emerald uh, bead and that said okay green green is the story here um, so I find a color story after they tell me what they want to do so this piece it's waiting for how I attach it to my person and I'm still thinking about that part it may be a couple loops at the top and a chain that's the simple down and dirty method or it may be a kumihimo rope that I would then create a bale and attach it to that, or it could be something else, who knows? It will tell me when it's ready. Um, but for this piece, um, the first thing that jumped out at me are these little bits of white. Uh, now, if I understand right where this panel comes from, it's probably Aboriginal, so those kinds of little dots are really common, but the flow of the piece is really unusual. Um, it's doesn't look like most of the other fabrics of its type that I've seen. So to me, that was really special. Um, I'm trying to change my process to be more, um, more art and less craft. And I know there's the, the battle between arts and crafts and, and I'm probably feeding into something silly, but it feels like there's like a next level, a next step that I can take my pieces to. So this, this unique panel is a really good way to do that, and it will be the largest thing I've stitched on to date. Um, so as I've sat with it, and these white dots have come out, I chose just plain matte size 11 seed beads. I use fire line for my stitching material, but there's you can also use silamide. Um, I know that's one product that's available here that is a really good product. You just have to tie knots, and I don't like to tie knots. So I use Fireline because it falls up on the end and creates a little knot of its own um, uh, with this thread zapper tool. So anyway, I started stitching, just picked a line of the, the little white lines and dots. Um, and I'll work on that for a while. I also just looked at my stash. I have a pretty big stash of beads. And like, okay, what colors jump out at me? Obviously the reds first. So. I grabbed an array of reds and oranges. Where they'll end up, I'm not sure. Um, but there's also this fabulous blue. So I have a couple of shades of blue, and these ones are hexagon shapes. I'd have to put my glasses on to be sure. And then a range of blacks and grays, because there are some little dark patches in here. And a little black on any project often will make it better. It adds a little depth and interest that even in something that doesn't naturally have it, it, it works nicely. So, so some of the ways that I would bead on this fabric, um, I have a couple of examples. With this piece, I have three vintage uh, scarab cabochons, and I have bezeled those and then embellished the bezels. And then I also have sequins, which I don't do a lot of sequin work, um, but this is ultimately going to be a Cleopatra-esque beaded collar. So I wanted it to have these kind of gold elements and I felt like the sequins and this sort of wing effect was gonna be the best way to represent that. Um, I have another piece. This one, 
I used a piece of lace and I've stitched it down. Now I used Misty Fuse, which is a fusing product to secure it to a piece of felt, but I've not used Misty Fuse before, so I wasn't sure how well it would stay. So I got all these little beads here and each of those is a little stitch that goes through the felt. And now I know with absolute certainty that it's not going anywhere. Um, this will be a necklace, a very substantial necklace, and I had to find a way to back it. So I got this cork, which has a really great texture and color, which I think is a lot of fun, but it also is really smooth. So in the places where it might touch your skin, it would feel really nice. The one last thing to do on this before I put the connection bits on it is to edge it. So all of this will have beads stitched along the edge and that will stitch through the cork. It's amazing how nice it is to stitch through. It goes through it like butter, but the needle and thread don't tear it up, which, you know, that's saying something. You just do have to be a little gentle, but that will secure all of these edges together. And then there'll be something else coming this way. It hasn't told me what it wants yet. <laughs> but when I get there, I'll figure it out. So. What I've been doing thus far, as I said, I'm working with these little white dots and my little white beads. It's going to actually be half of my glasses. Um, so what I'm doing at, the, at this point is really similar to, say, a French knot. So my thread is coming up out of one of the little white dots. I picked up one white bead and I'm just going to go down through kind of the other side of the dot. And I figured out that I can actually just do it in one stitch to come up through the next dot along one edge. It's just a really, really simple stitch. Um, as I said, if you were embroidering this, you might do a French knot, but it's, uh, that's not how I work. I'm not really set up all that great here because I don't want to knock over my beads, so they're sort of off to the side. But normally I would have everything laid out. Um, so I'd have a selection of colors and all that, so minimizing mess. So literally it's just a little stitch down the bead, move on to the next one. Now there are places on this, I don't know if you can see, where there's these circles. I will probably do some sort of larger bead in that space and I may want to bezel those depending mm -hmm. on how big it is and what kind it is. And that uses a stitch called Coyote Stitch. People have been doing it for about ever. And it starts with a back stitch row. And if you've done needlework, you probably have done back stitch. And what it involves is picking up a row of beads, say three or four beads, you lay those down, you get them lined up nice along the edge of your thing, and you go straight down with your needle on the, um, to the underside. And then whenever you come back up, the back stitch part of it is you come back up behind. So it's I kind of refer to it as three steps forward, one step back. So when you step, come back, you'll go back through some of those beads you just laid down and that stitches them down to the, the fabric. So in those places where there are circles, I might choose to do a bezel. Um, so that three steps forward, one step back peyote base is done in even numbers. And then it, when you do peyote, I don't know if you're familiar, you do every other bead, you sit another bead on top of it. So it makes it sort of like bricks, the way that they're lined up, um, a little offset. And that grows up and around the piece, and then it holds it very securely. This is a peyote bezel, which is by way of, by way of example. Do you build that first, or do you, and then put the stone in? You glue you, the stone down first. You glue the stone yeah. first. I glue mine down with E6000. And then it's pretty secure, but I'm a little paranoid that something's gonna come off. And God forbid one of my babies is broken. Uh, so I make sure that they're gonna stay down really well by the bezel. And there's other ways you can bezel, and I'm just kind of, I've been beading since 2001, but I feel like I'm really learning a lot at this point. Just new skills and um, switching to working on fabric like this is rather different. Um, even this piece, this is the first I've used lace like this. Um, so it's an exploration and I really love that, that ability to explore. And you know, people have been beading since 
someone found a rock with a hole in it and put a reed through it and tied it around their neck, right? And yet, there's things that I feel like they're new and, and exciting. Um, so that's one of the things that I think is awesome. Um, if you want to explore Beads on Fabric, this is a good book by Liz Kettle. There's a couple others out there um, available on the shelves. And, you know, Judy is a beater. She's happy to share her knowledge as well. Um, but there's so many different things you can do. I found these fun little cabochons. Nah, they don't match. <laughs> um, can I ask you what yeah. kind of needle you use? Uh, most of my needles are John James. Um, some people like, like tulip size? beading needles. Yeah. Um, I use 12s, 13s, and 15s, depending on what beads I'm using. I'd rather use a, an 11 if I can, but they're a little bit bigger. The uh, smaller number, bigger needles kind of thing. And um, they get really hard to thread when you get down into 12s or 13s and 15s. That's not my favorite. But if you have a size 15 seed bead, which is, do I have any? No, I do not. These are, they're smaller than all of these. And so then there's Charlotte's, which are even smaller. And then you need smaller needles. Um, the way I tell people to pick their needles is if you have really tight tension and you're a little bit of an uptight beater and you hold your needle tightly, don't get to look needles. They're beautiful, wonderful needles, but I snap them in half because I'm a little too uptight. When I calm down, I'll switch to tulip needles. <laughs> In the meantime, John James, they wind up all squiggly. Um, this is a relatively new needle, and it's hard and straight. <laughs> so, but it, it will bend, and it will get a little squiggly, but it won't break. So it will be okay going through the fabric. Mm -hmm. It's strong yeah. enough that... Yeah, it actually kind of helps a little because it's got mm -hmm. a little scoop to it. <laughs> So in that respect, it, it's a good thing. Um, did you have any other questions? I keep talking and I'm not giving you room to do that. Just keep? Yeah. Yeah. So, so this one is different from all the rest. Technically, I'm supposed to be talking about beading on fabric, but um, this is another kind of a reflection of my style and my personal approach to beading. This is a freeform hand stitch bracelet. So it's the same stitch that you use for this bezel, but I do it kind of at random. Um, I start with just a strand of beads, strong long ways across the bracelet, and I pick up different colors and sizes as I go. And then as I build up, I'm building in sort of these fan shapes, or like here where there's a hole in it, I just started a whole other strand, so picked up a bunch of beads and went around the side, sort of like going around the corner a little bit. Um, and it can be anything. I will never be able to absolutely reproduce this piece. It is 100% one of a kind. Even if I wrote down what I did, I would make a mistake and it would be different. Um, and I love that. This is one of a kind. I probably won't ever find these calves again. I have a red one too, I probably should have included that as well, but that to me is really the magic and what makes it mine, you know, because if this was a different kind of pattern, anybody could make it, but this one is the one that I made. And I think that a lot of people, um, you know, they would benefit from just the lift that comes from being unique and I strongly recommend it. So, um, but this one is bead weaving, and these are bead embroidery. Um, there's other people who do kumihima. I mentioned it before in relation to this piece. It's an ancient Japanese weaving technique that uses uh, strung beads, like pre-strung beads, and then it's like you switch these two, and then you switch these two, and then you turn it, and then you switch it. it. It's interesting because now there's these giant machines that do it, and they make like shoelaces and things like that. It's the exact same process. It was the ties on samurai uniform or on their armor way back, which is kind of a cool transition into this new thing like shoelaces. Um, <laughs> um, other people do stringing, and stringing, I hear people say, Oh, I just do stringing. And it's like, wait a minute, when I do this, 
If there's a small flaw in there, you are never going to know the difference. But in a strung piece, where there's only so many beads, it has to be perfect. It has to be pristine. So there is a certain elegance and skill and attention to detail that's in, involved with stringing that I think a lot of people don't appreciate. If you're a stringer, you have my kudos. I'm not that detail-oriented. <laughs> so. um, I'm trying to think of what else to add in. Anybody have a question? Help me out here. What was the fuse that you used on the panel? It's called Misty Fuse. Okay. Um, Even on the blue one also? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's sort of like magic. Yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> it's like sorcery. You iron it in on there, and like I have to really tug to pull these apart. And is that just a felt? Um, this one is batting. Uh, I didn't get this here. I think it's like Walmart brand, and now I have little fuzzies all over me. So you maybe ask Judy if there's something that doesn't have all the fuzzies. It's a little more like a, a cotton or a natural batting. Mm -hmm. or yeah, I think that's what it is. But, but yeah, it's getting all over me, and I wear a lot of black, so I'm not sure how well that's going to work. <laughs> yeah. I have a white dog, so I have a lint roller. <laughs> is that the gray? Is that a tool? What is that? Mm -hmm. This is a thread zapper. Um, this particular one is made by Beadsmith. What it really is, is a repurposed cautery tool. Push this little button, this little tip slides out. You can see it getting red. Uh -huh. It gets hot. So uh -huh. when I'm using this thread, which is nylon, it's a fused braided nylon. When I touch the end of it with this, it just balls up. Just oh, so just handy. Knots, then. No knots. <laughs> it makes its own knot. Yeah. Um, whoever came up with it, like I said, this one is Beadsmith brand. I've seen other brands. Um, it was a game changer and they be embroidered, quite literally. Uh, I know that sounds like it may be an overstatement, but it truly isn't. It's like, yeah. Where do you, where do, you do it? Um, this one I bought at a bead store. Uh, I've seen them online. There's lots of different sources for them. There's a couple different bead stores that are within driving distance of here. Okay. And, um, but yeah. If you are interested in getting into beading in any form, I recommend taking some basic classes. Learning to do peyote stitch is a really good beginning um, because you can do so much with it. Uh, it's not just for bezels. You can make little peyote tubes and they're like little beaded beads or you can make full peyote panels. I've seen people do a whole bracelet that's like some sort of Celtic pattern or whatever. Um, I've seen people do tapestries that are like photorealist kind of stuff, which is just amazing to me. I don't have that kind of patience. I mean, I have some patience, obviously, but not that kind of patience. Um, but you know, this woman I've seen online, she's doing them with um, old photos of family members who were in the military, and then there's programs that you can put the picture into, and it pixelates it, basically, and turns mm -hmm. it into a bead pattern, wow. which is pretty pretty amazing. The bead's called Delica, so use for that. Um, but in terms of the beads I have here, I have standard size 11 seed beads. I don't know where the numbers come from. The, I've read somewhere that it might be that that's how many beads fit on an inch, but they're all a little different, so that doesn't seem quite accurate. They're different quality levels. These are pretty uniform. They cost a little more. These are very uneven. These are the cheapest beads you can buy. But when I'm doing bead embroidery or free form like this, there are times when I want a little narrow bead to fill a space. And these are really great for that because there's some that are fat, there's some that are skinny, there's some that are a little wonky and sort of wedge shaped. And with free form, there's a spot for all of them. They, they all could find home. Um, some of them are interesting shapes, like these are hexagons. Um, as are these, and these have a coating on them, so that's why they have this sort of iridescent quality about them. Uh, these ones do also. And then these have one single facet cut in the side of the glass bead. And that facet gives it a shimmer that you wouldn't get, which is kind of fun. Sometimes you want a little more shimmer. And, you know, glitter might be overkill. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. 
Um, and the beads are made by a number of different manufacturers. What you can get at Michael's and what you can get at a bead store and what you can get out here are all going to be different manufacturers um, because they're all selling at a certain price point. My tip for beads is buy the best beads you can buy. Uh, the same with tools. Buy the best quality you can afford at the moment and upgrade whenever you can. Tools are too important to not have the right materials. Your question about needles is, is great because that's an important question. That's a, a foundational element for this process. Um, and the, the needles, as I explained there, they kind of vary by preference. The same is true with thread. Um, some people use Fireline like I do. Other people use Nymo or Eslon or Selamide. I mean, the list is long. Uh, selamide is one that I used when I first started beading. I don't have any issues with the quality of it. It's great. It's a very good product. It's a high tensile strength upholstery thread, which is why it's good for beading. And standard sewing thread is it's too delicate. It, uh, particularly if you're using uh, like these hex beads, they have, tend to have very sharp edges, so when you go through them, if your thread doesn't go straight through the hole, it can rub on it and it can cut the bead. Crystals are like that, some pearls or stone beads are like that. Um, so if you can get a higher tensile strength on your thread, you're going to have it hold up better. Or you put a little rounded bead on either end of the sharp ones to help kind of buffer them. Um, the, uh, the thread the only reason I switched away from selamide was because of that whole knox thing. I know, it sounds silly. But <laughs> if you don't know the right knot, and there's so many different kinds of knots, I feel like a sailor now that I've learned to do beadwork. Because <laughs> now I know a lark's head knot, and I know cat hitch, and I was like, I didn't really expect to do this. I should have been a boy scout, it would have helped. <laughs> Um, but yeah, knots are really important, and if you don't use the right knot for the job, you wind up with knots that get stuck in your beads, knots that slide apart, because some of them are meant to be more flexible and, and movable than others, and so that's a big deal. Um, and that's something that you just pick up as you go along. Having those kinds of classes where you learn the basics from a, a designer who's been doing it for a while is priceless. Um, every time I have a class, and I've been beating since 2001, so, you know, it's been a minute. Um, but every time I take a class, I learn some new tip or trick that has nothing to do with the pattern, and, I, and it's not what I expected at all, and I'm like, it's brilliant, you know? You have those moments of uh, eureka, and uh, that's, that to me is priceless, and you, you cannot even guess where it's going to come from, so whenever you get the chance to take a class. And online classes have led to people being able to take classes with folks from all over the world. Um, I was in a class with Sabine Lippert from Germany, and there was a person in the class with us who was taking the class from Singapore. I mean, like, we're covered many time zones here, and she's an amazing teacher. It was an amazing project. I learned so much information outside of the project itself, so well worth it. Absolutely, hands down. Um, if you want any kind of um, feedback on anything, or just to talk beading at some point, um, I am on Instagram. It's at Amy's Garden, and I'm happy to like if you say hey, you know, artistic artifacts, creative quest, whatever. Um, let me know where where you're coming from. That's helpful. Um, I email, Facebook, Instagram, those are all an option. Um, I'm, I also have a group on Facebook, forgive the silly name, it's the uh, Alexandria Beatty Social Club. <laughs> We're just hanging out to chit chat, there's no selling, there's no stores involved, it's just people who enjoy beating in a local area so we can get together and hang out and chit chat. If you want to look for that on Facebook, that's another uh, option for you. So that's kind of all I got. Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad to hang out with you. <laughs>